welcome everyone today as we come to celebrate Christ and celebrate Christ in one another. Again, if you did not pick up your small communion cup coming in, raise your hand and one of the ushers will give one to you. Let us begin our worship this morning by standing and singing page 380, There's Within My Heart, a melody, verses 1, 3, and 5.
Today we come together for various reasons, actually. Some of you come because you need a little time with God. Some of you all come today because you need to see another human face that you can look at and you can see from the grin lines up here, the smile lines, that there's still someone who is happy. We gather together in all these things, but today we also gather for communion. And communion is one of those things that way too often we begin to take for granted. And I'd like to share with you today from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, the 23rd to the 29th verses. And here Paul is saying, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. When you hear what Paul is actually saying here within the scripture, we find that today we come to exercise a ritual of the church, a sacrament of the church. Sacrament meaning that God is at work, not man. And we exercise this, and it becomes a very significant matter to the life of the church. It's something that we ourselves need to be able to look at and to say within ourselves, this I do because of what I know about Christ. First of all, we have to recognize that within the scripture, Paul is giving us a revelation. And the revelation that he is giving us is that number one, we don't take communion because we're United Methodists. We don't take it only once a month because we're United Methodists either. If you go down to the end of the block with the disciples, they take it every week. If you go to the Presbyterians, they take it usually once, sometimes every week. If you go to the Baptist church, you might get it once a year, maybe not. But we have to realize that what he is telling us, what Paul is trying to share with us, is that within this revelation, this is not something which we haphazardly do. It was something, if you listen to those words again, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. Then he goes in to the ritual. That on the night that Jesus was betrayed, we do this as Paul would say, because it's something which was given to us. We don't do it because of our name. We don't do it because of the day of the week. We do it because it is a revelation to us that Christ told us to do it. And as he told us to do it, we have to recognize that there's more to it than just coming forth. Years ago, I ask the question, and actually I brought this up here in the last few years as well, why is Communion Sunday the Sunday of lowest attendance in the church? Almost every church I've ever served, it's always been the Sunday of lowest attendance. And so one Sunday I put it to the congregation. I said, why is it that you don't come on Communion Sundays? After church, I had a woman who was visiting the church, she was actually Lutheran, and she came up to me and she says, I'm going to tell you why they don't come. And I said, okay. And she says, no one likes to come to the altar. 
She was right. We're afraid to come to the altar. I have learned within my life that there are times that coming into the church itself, when the church has been closed for the day, or you come up at night and pick something up, and you come through these doors, you look around, and here it is, the sanctuary, the house of God. And my greatest desire is how fast can I get in and out of here? And if you think it's great here, if you've ever been in this sanctuary in the dark, are behind us in the storage area picking something up, you find that you face and confront all your fears. You realize that you are in the house of God. That's what she was trying to say. That people, when they come forward to be able to partake, they're having to confront who they really are and what they're actually about. The other is, is that it's a symbol if we remember in those words, he took the bread and he broke it. He took the cup and he lifted it. And he said in the bread, this is my body broken. He said within the cup, this is my blood which is shed. This is our statement of faith. Isn't that what John 3.16 basically tells us? That God loved us enough that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should live not perish we ourselves when we take that symbol and we remember it and we look at it we find it's a humbling experience some of you may have asked through my time here why usually on communion Sundays at the last minute it seems I was asking people to help serve communion it wasn't that I didn't have foresight it was trying to change the people every week or every month that helped. When I do finally leave, you'll find that communion will probably be what I miss the most. To be able to offer Christ in this form to the people of God. But when you come forward and you take that bread and you pull it off and you lay it in the hand of another and say, this is the body of Christ broken. It's a very humbling experience. It's one that makes us remember what Paul was telling us in our humbleness is that we ourselves, by the breaking of that bread and by partaking it, we have offered within ourselves a symbol to others. In those symbols, we have to remember that the church has lots of symbols. One of them I want to thank Sandy for doing is that she lit the candles. And the thing is, is I didn't look to see if they were lit. But those candles represent the light of Christ. They're not up there just to make this look fancy or make it look pure. pure. What it's there for is to remind us that the light of Christ is before us. It surrounds the altar. It reminds us in its glow that we don't have to walk in darkness. And many years ago at a camp, I was starting camp. And something that I always did, which was a little unusual, is that I began church camp with communion instead of just ending it with communion. And I remember lifting the cup. And when I lifted it, I asked those fourth and fifth graders, what does this mean? And I got the same answers as normal. Some of them said, it means communion. Some of them said, oh, it's grape juice. But there's one little fourth grade girl who looked up at me and she said, that's the cup that is passed on. That blew me away. I've always remembered it. Because what a theology of the Eucharist. What a theology of realizing as a fourth grader that that cup, which contains the manifestation of the blood of Christ, is a cup that is passed from me to you and from you to one another. It reminds us that in partaking, that this is not only sacred, but it is something that binds us as one person. We sit back and we talk today about the church and what its future is going to look like. We sit back and we talk about what's going on in our world. We sit back and we talk about how innocence is being stripped away from our children. But yet, what innocence could we offer more 
than that that come of Christ. What innocence could we offer to our children and grandchildren more than the knowledge of what that symbol actually means and what it means to be part of that? It's a symbol of the new covenant. It is a bloodletting. The covenant contains the manifestation of Christ, the blood of Christ. In Moses' time, there's a bloodletting also in circumcision. It is with that blood that was spilled that the sacrifice is made. But it also looks to us and it says that it's a proclamation. When we ourselves look, we say oftentimes when we take the bread and the juice, who we are. Today we're going to do that. We're going to take that bread and we're going to take that juice and we're going to proclaim to the world who we are. Because within it is a statement of your entire faith. As you partake within that juice, when you take in that bread, you're telling the world what happened on Mount Calvary. You're telling the world that you fully believe that Jesus Christ died for yours and my sin. You're telling them that you have a commitment in the lifting of that bread and the drinking of that juice of more than as I would joke about styrofoam, but it's in its way that we are proclaiming to the world our faith in Christ. You know, that's really the mission and the purpose of the church. I've seen churches sit back and try to work out a mission statement. The DS asked that of the SPRC earlier this year. What is your mission? And it's hard until we try to just summarize it. And the summarization is that is Christ told us to go forth and make disciples. Well, how do you do that? You do that by proclaiming Christ. It's not about the type of music you sing. It's not about what we wear. It's about we ourselves proclaiming to the world that we fully understand and believe that Christ died on the cross for our sins. And by the lifting of that bread and that cup, we're telling the world that this is my faith. This is who I really am within myself. But how we proclaim it is also important. I have been giving communion for years and years. One of the earliest times as a chaplain's assistant, I remember in Herzegonara, Germany, offering communion for one of the first times. And we had those neat little rice wafers that you can't get any longer. I've looked for them. But I remember as we were passing that on, one of the single soldiers that was at chapel that day, he picked it up, and when he did, he dropped it. But it's a perfect circle. What's it going to do? It's going to row. And it did grow. And I reached over just like some of you when you take the bread and pop it in your mouth before you look to the juice. And the thing of it is, is that I just reached over and he took another one. But then I noticed as I was going on down the line, he had crawled under the altar rail and was crawling up by the organ to pick up that bread. It was that important to him. But for me... It was something which I didn't quite understand about that importance to him. For those of you who have not had the opportunity of serving communion, what joy I have in watching your children and your grandchildren. As you bring them up, we pull off that piece of bread and we give it to that child and the child doesn't wait for the juice. They take it and they cram it into their mouth. That's proclamation. That's who we should be. It's not a symbol of saying we should do it in an irreverent manner. It's saying to us we should take it with such joy that it's something that we can't wait for. And what always tops it off is when that same child in the arm of their parent, when I give it to them and they start to reach up their mouth, that little child reaches and snatches it from their parent's hand and puts it into their mouth too, saying, I need more. What would happen if we as United Methodists today were to have a proclamation of our faith 
a proclamation that Christ lives within us to the point that we ourselves at the end of communion would be saying, we want more. That's what this proclamation is. How do we proclaim it? How do we get to that point? We do it by self-examination. You see, this is where this becomes a Lenten sermon. Because these 46 days, you'll discover is actually a time of self-examination. Of being able to look into yourself as you come forward to the house of God. And yes, confronting our sins. Because we are many. Of being able to come forward to the house of God and be able to meet with friends and be able to see them and recognize them as well as children of God and being able to give praise for that. But Paul said it in a different way. He says, but if we drink of this and eat of it in a matter that we have not examined, then we find that the death of Christ is before us. How many Easter's have we seen? How many Easter's have you seen? And you can remember back to those days where Easter would come and this place would be packed. We can remember back to those days where we would even process in the Easter lilies, the cross. We'd take away the darkness of Good Friday. And we had lifted up, and in that itself, we had an understanding, not that it was just Easter Sunday, but that actually Christ had risen from the tomb. And all this comes back to communion, our proclamation. Because in our self-examination, we are saying we understand what we proclaim. We understand that even though I'm a sinner, Christ has found me worthy. We understand that even though I may make mistakes in life, Christ has found me worthy. We begin to understand that even though we ourselves may be aging with wisdom and beauty, in that age and beauty, Christ has found us worthy. It's not about what you thought before you came up. It's about how we partake. And there are times that I know I've frustrated some of you because I don't partake all the time. And there are reasons for that. And sometimes it's because, God, I don't find myself worthy. Not today. And that's okay. But what we do find within ourselves is Christ constantly looking to us and saying, do this in remembrance of me. What's your remembrance of him? You'll tell the world here in a moment when we partake. Will it be joy? Will it be thanksgiving? Or will it be just a little bit of juice and a small cracker? Christ calls us today to his altar. Christ calls us today to partake just as he gave us that ritual. And he says, do it in remembrance. Let's today do that with joy, with hope, and with praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your love and your many mercies. But as we look to you this day, O oh Lord, we pray that you will bless us, that you will find us and help us to know that you have found us worthy that we can find that joy and that hope within our life. That we ourselves will see the power you've instilled within us, not just in this sacrament, but in all things we do within your name. Bless your church and bless your people everywhere that this day we become a symbol again of your hope and your love to the world. Amen.
God makes this invitation to everyone that strives to live in love and charity with their neighbor to come and take this communion to themselves. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. As we look to joys within our life, I'm going to do something we haven't done in a very long time. What joys do you have to share today? Give me joy. Yes, yeah. You completed. We do. We have several who are back with us who have been sick, and that is always a joy. Yes. I'm one of those that was sick. Well, and we're, but you've got your shots, and you're happy now. I'm very happy. So anyway, it's good to have you back, Ms. Terry. Myra, you had said? I was just a joy to be in church. It is a joy to be in church. It really is. And I'm remembering now why I hadn't done this. It's understanding you through the mask is very difficult. I want you to know that as well. Yes. Hi. We have started choir and handouts, and we'll be performing Palm Sunday and Easter for you all. All right. That is wonderful. The choir is back, and the handbells are back. And if you're interested in being part of the handbell choir, even if you don't have an experience, I'm certain that they will help teach you. Just take time to see Rachel, and she'll help you with that. Any other? If not, and so, with your people on earth and all the company in heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the way of those that we do need to remember, let's continue to remember all of our homebound and those that may be homebound by their own desire. Let's also today remember Kara Burton. You know she had been with us the last couple weeks. Her grandfather contracted COVID and was not doing very well. He is Last we heard of him staying put in a uh, medical coma to help him to be able to breathe more easily. But let's remember Carol Burton in our prayers this day. Let's remember the church in our prayers as well. Not just University Church, but all the churches that we ourselves remember. The task that God has given us, but even more, the power and the ability to do the things that He desires. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God, Christ is risen, Christ is the Lord. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do not presume to come to this your table, trusting in our unrighteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather in the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, and the property is always have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to partake of this sacrament of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that we may walk in the newness of life, may grow through his likeness. May evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We are reminded that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his friends and disciples in the upper room. 